and we praise, every praise is to our God, God my Savior, God my healer, God my deliverer, yes he is, yes he is, yes he is, yes he is. Yes, he is. Trust and Obey was written in 1887. The words were written by John H. Samus, and the music came from Daniel B. Towner. The scriptural basis for this hymn is John 8, 31. If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Verse 32 goes on to say, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Heavenly Father, we just give you praise and thanksgiving for the many blessings you give us. What joy we have and what opportunity we have to share life with our family and friends. 
Lord, there's so much that we have, and we're so grateful, but especially our salvation of eternal life. What great joy that brings us, Lord, and security. And now, Lord, please receive these gifts as tokens of gratitude that we have for all the blessings you provided for us. In Jesus' name, amen. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on the way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but a star quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear can abide now we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Men and fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey. Father, we give you praise and thanksgiving for a wonderful week that we've had, for the many joys that we've had and the privileges that we've had before us. And today, Heavenly Father, we especially come to you with our nation as we're beckoning on a big election and uh, all the things that are being said and done. But Lord, we pray for clarity for the people of America to be clear and that you send us the person that we need to have that leads us into the next four years, Father God, and present us to the world and also help the world and help our own selves and to be able to dig ourselves out of the messes that we've created for ourselves. We thank you, though, that you're a sovereign God and you are in control and that we can have nothing to fear because you are the ultimate commander and chief and king of the world. We come to you especially too, Lord, for those who bravely put their lives on the line every week that go in foreign countries to hear on our streets. And this week, Wichita especially is grieving over a young man who lost his life fighting a fire here. And uh, I pray for Ty and his family as they mourn his loss and for all the fellow fighter fighters and all those who emergency responders who worked with him and for the challenges that they have. We just pray that you'll lift their spirits and as they uh, give thanks for your love and for your care that you will lift their spirits to look to you for strength. We give you praise too, Lord, for taking care of our shut-ins. I pray especially for our sister Lucille and for our sister Joyce, whose son lost his dad. I just pray for him, Lord, just to strengthen him also, and for Karen as she continues to rehabilitate. I pray also for Cindy, Lord, watch over her and give her strength. I pray also thank you, God, for Nick and what he went through last weekend and that you delivered him from it and that healing came to his body and he's back 
full strength, we just give you praise, Lord. I pray also, too, for Clara, Lord, who took a spill, Lord, a few weeks ago, and that you continue to bring healing to her. I pray for our brother Bill, Lord, who's going to be getting some scans, and also for his eyes. I just pray that he'll feel your presence by his side and that you bring him through that and they can find things that they can help and do and, and help care for him, Father. I pray also too, Father, for Steve's mom, for your continued care for her, for Doug Isley. Uh, Lord, I pray for um, Terry, uh, that uh, you'll be with him, Lord, as he's battling his cancer. We pray for him, Lord, and his family. We pray also to um, Father God for Mark and preparing for surgery. I praise you also too that, Jared, uh, that um, Jordan came home from the hospital this week. Lord, we give you praise. We pray also too for Jackie and for the healing of her surgery and continued healing for Linda. And also too, Father God, I give you praise and thanksgiving for the healing that you've done on Donnie and also on Joyce and her back. I pray also too, Father God, for Brad and Sega, both who are struggling with issues, Lord, that you continue to bless them and bring healing to their minds and to their bodies and to you, Lord. I pray also too, as students and teachers are getting bedded back, ready to go back to school and to the workplace, I just pray that you'll be with them. Be with our family too here, of the many people that deal with the, the public, and sometimes it's not always easy to deal with them, Jesus. Just give them an added strength and power on their lives, Lord. Pray also too, Father God, for Mr. Sater as he's coming back to be married, for Mr. Mack who's battling his cancer, and for Perry, and also for Floyd, and also for <clears throat> Everett Long, and also Samantha, and Jason, and Jordan, Lord, as they are all battling their cancers at different levels, Lord, we pray for healing for them. I pray also for Tim and for his kidney, Lord, restore, bring health. And Father God, also too, uh, we pray for those who've lost loved ones this week and also this year, Lord, who continue to grieve their loss. I pray also too, Father God, um, for uh, Bill Rogers continue to bring healing to his body and strength and for his heart. And Father God, now as we come to you, uh, we want to hear from your word today. We know your word is powerful and that it can slice our hearts and bring health to it and cut out the cancers of sin in it. Jesus, we pray for that today. And that, Lord, your joy will just overflow in our hearts, Christ, this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Matt Chandler is a popular pastor. Thank you, Sandy. Now, I know guys that you don't know about wives ever bailing you out, but my wife always does. And I'm very grateful for her work. But I get to go on sometimes and I forget some of the things that need to get done and whatnot. But um, Matt Chandler had the opportunity of a young lady that he was working with and some of her friends were working with because she did not know Christ. And they were hoping that as they brought her to this evangelist, that it would help her understand the Christian faith and that she'd give her heart to the Lord. But as you know, this is all in the Lord's doing. And they brought her to this crusade that they thought was going to be a real super deal. And um, the preacher got up and he started teaching. And he started giving statistics about STDs and about wayward women and stuff like that. And they didn't know that much about her past. And then he took this beautiful rose off this beautiful rose bush and clipped it. And then he had it just passed around through 800 people in the auditorium. And how fresh it looked when it was in here, but at the end, people passing it and touching it and petals falling off and it wilted. And then he said, this is what it's like. You who continue in that kind of sin. And afterwards, she left without a word. After the pastor said, you don't want to be a dirty rose. A few weeks later, she hadn't shown up for church anymore. And Matt went and called her and 
She says, well, I felt like a dirty rose and I didn't be around. I don't deserve to be around people like you and your church. Totally the opposite of what the message was meant to say. You know, sometimes we can feel like dirty roses. Sometimes we feel as Christians we fail and we don't do very well. And we also have Christian friends who don't do very well with us and we don't do well with them. And today we have a great thing going on here with David. Because David is going to show us how even though you have had people rebel, he's rebelled himself. How sinful you are. No matter what betrayals you've had or you betrayed. How angry and rejected you feel. God's forgiveness is for us. And his forgiveness can work in us to forgive others. If you remember, David was at the peak of his kingdom. And if you remember, he was told not to go out anymore and he stayed at home and he was looking out on his kingdom from the palace and he saw that beautiful Bathsheba. His lust got to him, brought her over, they did the deed and she got pregnant. In doing so, he brought her husband in to try to solve the moment so he wouldn't look guilty. And it didn't work, and so he finally had sent back to the field after three days and had him killed in battle. David not only had committed adultery, but he had also killed one of his favorite, one of his best soldiers. And after nine months of pregnancy, Nathan the prophet comes to him and says, David, you're guilty. And God's angry at you. And the baby that she's going to have is going to die. And everything that you made it try to look so good, it's not good. In fact, God is going to allow you to have ripples. Yes, he has forgiven you. But there will be ripple effects in your life that are going to affect you for now and to the end of your kingdom ministry. And we saw it, didn't we? Amnon, his one son rapes his half-sister. That half-sister has a brother by the name of Absalom who finds out. And David's furious about hearing about it, but he doesn't do anything. And Absalom, her brother, takes things in his own hands and in two years he murders him. Then Absalom runs to his grandparents and stays out of his father's way and yet they don't have any relationship and he's worried about Absalom and he misses him. And instead of disciplining him, he lets him stay at his grandparents. And then finally, Absalom says, to Joab, I want to see my father, and he puts him off. And so Absalom burns down Joab's field so he finally gets attention and he gets to go see his father. But you know what happens? There's no reconciliation between the two of them. David kisses his head, but Absalom does not confess, does not repent of what he's done. And then Absalom begins to sit at the giddy gate and tries to steal the kingdom, of which he does. Causes a rebellion and a coup against David. And finally, David has to run from Jerusalem for his life. And Absalom wants to kill his father so he can take control. Because he had no respect for his father. Didn't care for him. And so much so that he robbed some of his best men, Ahithophel. He was a counselor for David, and they said that if you listen to Hithophel, that it was just like getting God's advice. And Absalom stole him and got him away because Absalom knew Ahithophel was mad at David. Because Ahithophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba, who David broke that marriage apart and committed adultery with his granddaughter. So Ahithophel was great to be on top with him. And as David runs, Shimei comes after him and curses him out because he's Saul's heritage. And he's angry at David. All these people are against him. And then Absalom tries to kill his father. And David says to his general Joab now, make sure everybody knows not to hurt Absalom when we catch him. And Absalom is pretty arrogant. Pretty full of himself, hair flowing out down to his, his, down his back. 
But as he's riding and battling in the forest, his hair gets caught in a tree and he's hanging there, suspended between earth and heaven. And nobody wants to touch Absalom because David said, don't kill my son. (laughs) But Joab saw him as an enemy of the state and took and killed him. When David finds out, he's broken. He doesn't do anything to Absalom because he knows Absalom is a strong fighter. But he also knows the pain of losing a son again. Now this is David's third son that he's lost. But Absalom was very special because he was supposed to take David's spot. And we see today in the text how broken David was because of the loss of his son. The Bible tells us today that, And Joab was told, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom, for the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people, for the people heard it and said that day that the king is grieved for his son. And the people stole back into the city that day as people who were ashamed to steal away when they flee in battle. Joab said to David, David, what are you doing? You have people who defended you. You have people who fought and put their lives on the line for you. And you are dissing them because you're grieving so much. And this son who tried to kill you, they were trying to defend you from. And that you were hurting them so much so that they feel bad that they won the battle against Absalom. And they're going to turn on you, David. And David, you need to change your focus. Yes, I know you're grieving for your son. But you're going to lose your kingdom if you don't shape up. Unlike David, who was insensitive to the sacrifices of his men, this time he was. Because his love for Absalom was so much greater. And what David finally does, and Joab wakes him up. And like Winston Churchill said to the men who were honoring him for the work that he'd done, He talked about his country and he says, you failed to express that it was all these people who won, not me. I may have helped out, but it was these people who did it and they deserved the glory. And you see, David was so suffering in his heart for his son that he didn't see it. And he needed to be taken out of his blindness to open his eyes. And Joab's cutting speech gets to it. Look what he says. Then Job came into the house of the king and said, Today you have disgraced all your servants, who today have saved your life, and that you love your enemies and hate your friends, for you have declared today that you, that you regard enough princes as not servants. For today I perceive Absalom had lived, and all that you had died today, that you may be, have been pleased you well. Saying, you would have been happier if Absalom was alive and all your troops had died. So what are you thinking? Start thinking clearly, David. You see, and one of the sad things that we notice here of David, and this is something we need to be careful in our own lives as we get experience and as we get older. If you notice, as David goes along now, he doesn't pray as much as he did when he was first starting out. He was on his knees every day. But he wasn't discerning the Lord. He was going by what he felt and what was going on. And let me tell you something. You know, as I do, it's very easy to go with your premonitions and what you feel as you get older because you've got experience in this. But my friends, the most important thing you can do is start every situation that you're in in prayer. No matter how much wisdom and know how much background you have, No matter how much history you have, the Bible says it very clearly. Those who build the house without the Lord are laboring in vain. And David forgot his own words. David was going by his feelings rather than what he knew to be true. And this is why it was so helpful that Joab came up and woke him up. Many of us, many Christians fall. Because they make the biggest
what our feelings are than what the facts are. In fact, what is generating today facts are the feelings. We feel and so therefore we make the fact. That's not true. It begins with the facts and the feelings follow. And many Christians make the mistake. I love this illustration. This is Campus Crusade for Christ. It's in your bulletin this morning. And it's that our faith feeds the facts. But we trust in the facts. That's the engine that pulls down the road. And put our faith in the facts of the The fact that Jesus rose from the dead. The fact that we are living with Christ in our hearts right now. Those facts are moving us. My friend uh, Galen, he used to work for the railroad. You don't tr- pull a train with a caboose. How many people in our society today are pulling their train of life down the road because they're feeling and not going by the facts? How can we have this wonderful girl, Riley Gaines, who wins even with a man who's cheating? Because he claims that he's transgender. And swims against them and they tie. And they give him. They give him the reward. And they say, just stand off to the side, Riley. And he's a man. He's built different. And he's stronger. And yet he only tied. You see, he was cheating. And he is still cheating. Because what he's done... (laughs) He was only ranked in men about 400 or 632 in male swimmers in the NCA, But with women, he was number one. That's going by feelings and how we feel rather than what the facts are and the truth of the matter is. The same thing is true in our lives. I've had, I can't tell you how many marriages and people that have gotten married. Well, he was such a nice guy. And, and he was so good to me. He brought flowers. Yeah, did he tell you that he stole them out of the drugstore? Oh, he treated me so well. Yeah, did you talk to his other ex-wives who they get beaten after a while? Oh, yeah, but he's a different guy. Feelings. Facts. And that's the problem here. Our world is pushing itself down the track with feelings. And we're headed for disaster if we don't look at the facts. Every Christian can easily struggle at this. If we don't go by the facts. And live by those facts. And put our faith in the facts of scripture. And the facts of God's will. Rather than our feelings. Oh, I, he made me feel so good. Don't do that. How many nights of passions have people made mistakes because they were feeling so wonderful and it destroyed their lives? David now has to rebuild, he's got to put his feelings aside. He's got to deal with because he's going to lose a nation. Joab was friend enough to him to confront him about this. Now the people were in dispute throughout all the tribes of Israel. Saying the king has saved us from the hand of our enemies. He had delivered us from the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled from the land because of Absalom. And Absalom who we anointed over us. He died in battle. And now therefore why do we say nothing about bringing back the king. David's got a problem here. Because you see, even the very people in Judah, in Jerusalem, he had abandoned them. He had to run for his life. And they're saying, wait a minute now. He wants to come back after he jumped ship because he thought he was going to get killed? What's the deal? That's his people in Judah. No less the tribes up in northern Israel. And David's got a dilemma. As a king now, he's got to bring people together. He's got to bring the family of Israel together. He's got to work to do that. And David begins this journey. You know, if you're having problems in your families, you've got to follow this example. How David brings all these different factions together. 
and works very diligently in bringing them back together so they will be under one king in Israel. And that Israel and Jordan would become together again. So King David sent Zadok and Abathar the priest, saying, Speak to the elders of Judah, saying, why are you the last to bring the, back, the king back to his house since the words of all Israel have come to the king, the very house? And you are my brother, you are my bone, and you are my flesh. Why then do you the last to bring back the king? His own people. And it's because David was struggling. And they felt bad about it. But they also felt that he had jumped ship on them. And they didn't understand it. And David needed a lot of work to do. And how is he going to unite the army? How is he going to unite Judah and Israel, who were divided, that he was bringing back together when this whole thing broke out in his own family? But you see what David does? And this is the key, folks. If you want to bring back unity to your family, David does a key issue, which is he puts out the peace olive branch. He extends it to the unlikely people. He opens his life up to them and wants to bring reconciliation to them. You see, and there are people who are going to be, when you do this, let me tell you something, there are people who live in the darkness. And they do not see the light. And when they're living in the darkness, they're not going to trust your peacemaking efforts. They think you've got a con job on and you're going to try to get them weak and try to flip them. But you do what the Word of God says. And this is what David does. He worked at repairing those broken relationships. He worked at forgiving you know, in Colossians it says, there are people who live in darkness. We lived in darkness before God, through Jesus Christ, brought the light into our hearts. And when you're living in the dominion of darkness, it's hard to see good things in the truth. It's like little Johnny who doesn't want to go into his bedroom because it's dark. He's fearful. You see, when people live in the darkness, they're afraid. And they do things to cheat and to lie and to steal because they don't think the light is going to do it right. They don't trust in a God. And so they got to do all these devious practices because they're living in the darkness. They're fearful. The darkness can be a scary place. You see, in a lot of people living in the darkness are fearful, and that's why they do all these sad, wicked things. They're scared to face life alone. They're afraid that they're going to be robbed of their courage and hope. And so they do things to people to get the advantage. They discover that the dark place is not an easy place to hang at. I was reading about a guy who started an eBay atheist, they called him. And he built up this group of people of atheists and he realized that as he listened to the Christian message, he was living in the darkness and fear. Rather than seeing the light and being exposed to the light and everything coming clear. Rather they were living in the trauma of life and, and they were not they were wandering in the darkness. An atheist will say to you and to me, hmm, you Christians need a crutch, and that's why you believe in Christ. <laughs> Let me tell you something. We're all limping. We all need Christ because we're sinners and we're broken. And if we let the darkness consume us, we will be part of that world. But Jesus says, and Paul says, that the light shines in the darkness and gives us life. And that I need Christ. I don't doubt it at all. I need him every day, every moment. You think about it. <laughs> One day I came in here, you know, it was early in the morning, about four in the morning, and I 
Figured I could just run in and get something, and I didn't turn the lights on. And guess what happened? Now, somebody moved the chairs. And guess what happened to me? I hurt my shin. I fell down. And I was, Lord, forgive me. I said maybe a few words I shouldn't have. But I was stumbling. That's what happens with people in the darkness. They can't see. That's why the psalmist says, he's the light unto our path. Those little short steps. He shows us the way. And here we stumble. And when you stumble, you know you have to slow down. You know when you're in the darkness, you're prone to getting hurt. And you're prone to falling and everything's uncertain. That's what the darkness does. Where when we're in the light, we're not afraid. And we can walk boldly. And, and let me tell you, people who you live in the light and extend forgiveness to, they don't understand that. In fact, they may distrust what you do. They may say, you know, that, that, that you're trying to get over on. They don't understand the grace. David understands the grace because he was forgiven. And he knew that he was a mess up. Even though he had a man who was a, after God's own heart, he knew God's grace because he needed it because he messed up a lot. And that he followed. And, and Paul says this to us as Christians who are in the light. In Romans 12, 8, he says, if it is possible and it depends on you. Oh, oh, oh. depends on you, Christian, Dave, that you live peaceably with other people. Oh, that's tough. Some people make me mad. But I need to be at peace with them. And so David begins to do this reconciliation. He reconciles relationships in the grace of God because he looks at it from God's perspective. Now David also knows this is going to help him rebuild the kingdom. And you see, that's the beauty of obedience to God. When you obey God and do stuff like this, the blessings come. You don't have to fear. And David begins that reconciliation program. Look what it says. And say to Massa, are you not my bone and my flesh? God, to, God do so to me, and more also if you are not my commander of the army before we continually in place of Joab. So he swayed the hearts of all the men of Judah, just as the heart of one man. And they sent the word to the king, return, you and all your servants. David takes the general who Absalom was using that was trying to kill David and hunt him down and makes him his general. Now talk about forgiveness. Talk about letting go of the past. And he brings this guy in to be his general above Joab. Now, David does it for many reasons, but for one, for the grace of God. It brings unity to the group. Well, because we know it solidified both nations together. And they began to look at David differently, that he wasn't afraid to put Massa as his general. And David, too, had no longer trust and confidence in Joab. Because he disobeyed an order of David's. Where he killed David's own son, Absalom. And he was afraid that he might also take on more and try to overrun him. And so he makes Amasa his general. And in doing so, he solidifies. He takes an enemy and works with him. And Joab doesn't take it well, of course, but he's still a soldier. And David begins to bring the army together and also the nation. But then if you look, <laughs> look who's next on the list. Then the ferry boat went across to
to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. Now Shimei, the son of Gir, fell down before the king when he had crossed over the Jordan. And then he said to the king, do not let my Lord impute iniquity to me. Or remember the wrong your servant did on the day that my Lord, the king, left Jerusalem. That the king should take it to heart. Do you remember Shimei? He was the relative of Saul. And when he came out of Jerusalem, what does Shimei do? He's cursing him. Throwing dirt balls at him and rocks. And mocking him. And Abishai, who's Joab's brother, says, Let's, let me just slice and dice him. And David said, no. Well, here now the war is over. David comes back. And here by the Jordan, Shimei is waiting. He's begging He's confessing what he's done, his disobedience, his disrespect. And so David, instead of chopping him up again, he takes nasty Shimei and forgives him and lets him live. Now this is being spread throughout the kingdom, you see. And he's bringing amnesty to a fellow who doesn't deserve it. But how much so is it showing us what the grace of God can do in a person's life? As much as Shimei hurt him, David is willing to forgive him. And then right after that, not only does he forgive him, but Mephibosheth. You remember Mephibosheth? He was Jonathan's son, the crippled boy who could not do anything. And David took him by the table and brought him in. And Mephibosheth, the son of really Saul, came down to meet the king, and he had not cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he returned in peace. So it was when he had come to Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? Now, Mephibosheth didn't go with David because he felt he'd be a burden. But Mephibosheth also was faithful to David in that time, and that's why he let himself go. But Ziba said, no, 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 he's siding with Absalom. He made up this lie. And here Mephibosheth now meets the king. But the tragedy of it all, he's unkempt. He wasn't ready for the king to show up. He was not there for the king like he should have been. He was not ready. And today I want to share with you folks, there's a very important, excellent lesson here for us. You know, I work in emergency services with the police department, but these guys are always ready. <laughs> you know, you go from hours of boredom and all of a sudden, boom, it's hot. And you're running to a call and people are shooting guns. And you have to be on. I know when that young man came down the ladder and got on the truck and he was heading to Hayesville, he was ready. He went into that fire and lost his life. These guys are supposed to be ready all the time. And you see, Mephibosheth wasn't ready for the king. One of the glaring things that sticks out to me is that my worry is those people who are not ready for Jesus Christ when he returns. You know, we have some Christians who are very laissez-faire about it and apathetic, and they're eh, even ignorant about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says us to be ready, be doing the things that glorify God, and always be in a set of readiness for when he comes. There are other people I know who indulge in prophecy and Jesus is coming as soon as something else happens in the news. That's not what the Bible is talking about here. It's talking about just being in a set of readiness. Doing the will of the Father in your life every day. And walking before him. And being ready that if he comes today, you are ready to go. To take you home. But Fevashef wasn't there. David was disappointed, so much disappointed. And, and Mephibosheth wants to tell the story that how Ziba did him bad. 
Ziba was supposed to take care of Mephibosheth. But he didn't. That was his story. And you got two conflicting stories here. So you know what David does? He brings peace. He gives Ziba half of Saul's land and property. And he gives Mephibosheth half of Saul's property. To take care of them both. And he wants Mephibosheth to be ready for the king to be there for. How many of you are ready to meet Jesus? Ready for the king to come? It's so important. Don't let this day pass without you making it right with Jesus. Coming in, asking him to come into your heart and wash you from your sin and set you free. So that when he comes and the trumpet sounds, you are on your way to meet him. And after the whole thing with Ziba, we then see one fellow by the name of Brazili, who was very kind to David, supplied David with all that he needed while he was in the battle. And David says, I want you to go with me to Jerusalem so I can take care of you. And Brazili says, No. I'm too old. I like where I'm at. I'm very comfortable with my house and where I am. But you take my son and you give him all that you're going to give me. And he does. He gives him some land. In fact, later on, Jeremiah appreciates that he's got a place to go. That David gave that man his land. And you see, we find ourselves sometimes doing things for God, that we have to be very careful we're not doing it to get favor with him. You already have his favor, folks. In Jesus Christ, he's given it to you. And that you understand that we don't try to bargain with God and get more blessings out of him by doing good things. We do blessings because his Holy Spirit is in our hearts and they just flow out of our hearts. And the joy of Christ flows out of our hearts. This is why Basili came and gave that stuff to David. Because he really believed in David. He really wanted to see David succeed. And that he wasn't going to buy himself some way into it. No. But rather that he was just wanted to support. Because he knew David was right. And you see, that's why we serve the Lord. We give him glory because he is our only hope. He's our only rock. He's our only substance of life that gives us joy. And so we give ourselves to him fully, not with any tag on it. He's already given to us what we need. We just need to trust him for that. And the grace is seen there in the midst of it all. And the question comes to us, why do we serve Christ? Is it so we can get something out of him? Or is it because we just love him? And our hearts just spew with love because the Holy Spirit's inside of our hearts, giving us the strength to carry on, to walk through difficult times, and to ensure the beauty that God has given to us. That's where it should come from. It comes from a love for God. And that a peace will come over us. That we're not looking for anything out of it. And so David does that. And he cares for him. He's kind. Because this fellow wanted David to be the rightful king of the anointed that he was by his father in heaven. And today, folks, that's what we do. We stand for Christ. We stand maybe alone, but we're not afraid. I loved history. In fact, I'm going to get a chance to teach history this year at the Faith Academy. And there are people in history that are just so incredible, faithful to the Lord. I was reading about Polycarp. Now, Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. (laughs) But, you know, you can tell what a person's life by the way they die. And they took Polycarp and they dragged him into the arena... And Polycarp stood there knowing that he was with Jesus. And the proconsul wanted him to apostate, to become an apostate. Now, when we think about apostate or somebody who's an atheist, we think of them not believing in Christ. 
In those days, the atheists were the Christians. Do you realize that? They were considered atheists because they did not believe in the Greek Caesar or their gods. And because they believed in Jesus Christ, they were considered atheists. And Polycarp is sitting in front of the pro-council. <laughs> and they want him to denounce Christ. And then he could be okay. <laughs> and Picardy Park, 86 years old, he says, you know, I've followed Jesus for 86 years and he has not let me down. And for sure now, I'm not going to let it go. And they said to him, well, we're going to send wild animals to eat you alive. He said, bring them on. I'm not afraid. I'll have those wild animals. Well, we're going to burn you. <laughs> Polycarp said, burn me. It'll only last for a few minutes, but you're going to burn in hell for the rest of your life. And eternity. He stood firm for Jesus. That's what we are. That's who we are. That's who we belong to, Christ. And today, folks, the beautiful thing about it is number one, that we stand with Jesus as our King. He's in control. We have nothing to fear. That we are ready for His coming. At any moment, at any time, we're doing his will and we're excited to see him. And that we're grateful that he has reconciled us with God. We have nothing, all our sin has been done away with. And we're total in communion with God through Jesus Christ. And that we find ourselves as reconcilers to people around us who are still living in the darkness and still feel they have to do the dark things to hurt us and to do things so that they can get ahead. And we already are ahead, folks. We've won the Olympics of life because Jesus is in our heart. And that each day we're living in eternity, waiting to go to the next level. Let's pray together. Father, today we just give you thanks and praise for the wonderful hope that we have in you, Christ. It's exciting to go after life and not have fear, not to worry about the darkness, not to worry about the unknown future, because you hold it all. God, we just pray for faith, that faith that really puts itself in the truth that you give us and trust in you as we move through life. Thank you, Lord, now as we get together and have this opportunity to break bread and to drink the wine of the wonderful hope that you've given to us in Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
in remembrance of the body of Jesus Christ broken for us. Amen. Like manner also, Jesus took the cup. When he had supped, he said, This cup and his new covenant in my name, this do you in remembrance of me. blood of Jesus Christ that washed away all our sins. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We don't deserve it, and we thank you that he earned it for us, and that by his grace we are free from our sin, and that we have the promise of eternal life. Thank you, Jesus, for paying for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Please rise with me and receive the benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the great love of our Heavenly Father, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit be upon you now and to the day you leave this earth, to live for him and enjoy and give him glory. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.